Our next speaker is Mia Makicha. So hi, I'm a PhD student at Northeastern advised by Wolfgang, and this is just work with him, but really it's based on 20 years of influential papers in this area. Many authors are in this room. Um, okay, so we know data management, and just this simple process can get us a lot of good analysis, and depending on how complicated your input transformation output is, you can do a lot of very powerful and useful things and extract information, right? But sometimes you do this whole process, and you're like, I don't understand this output. What what happened? I didn't expect to get this. What went wrong? And what should my input have been to get the output that I wanted, right? So you somehow want to go back in reverse and reason about your input in terms of the output that you've gotten and you don't understand. And this was formalized as reverse data management in um, 2011 by Alexandra Melu and her collaborators. And the idea of reverse data management is to sort of ask, what interventions or what changes would you need in the input to get the output that you desired or expected, right? And this is a very general framework that can encapsulate a lot of important problems in database theory. So I will talk about a few. For example, deletion propagation studied since the 80s by Dayal and Bernstein. And um, uh, the question uh, is really like, if you have some output and you want to delete some rows from it, like for GDPR reasons, right? What change would you need to make in the input? And you can have different objectives with this. Maybe you want to change as little in the input as possible, or maybe you want as little um, output change, right? As little side effects as possible. And this was studied and the dichotomy was given by Peter Bunneman and collaborators in 2002. Okay, another important problem. We care about fairness, right? So we get some output and with different fairness metrics, perhaps we want some probability distributions or satisfy some hard constraints. We want to check, is the output fair? And if not, how close is it to being fair? And this can also be modeled in this reverse data management framework. Okay, we've seen that we can use a provenance semiring to compute a provenance polynomial when we're running our query, right? Now, what if I look at this provenance expression and I want to find the minimum version of this, like a smaller formula that is equivalent to it? Then it turns out what we show is you can compute it by using different query plans to get the minimal possible version. And you can model this as a reverse data management problem as well. All right. Another example. What if you care about what inputs are responsible for your data, right? How much does some particular input tuple matter towards the output of your query? And you can formalize this. And this was formalized in 2010 based on Harpel notions of causality. And this can also be modeled in this reverse data management way. Okay. So you have all of these different problems that we'd like to solve. So for some fixed query, I give you some arbitrary database, you produce the output, and then you want to run some reverse data management problem. It could be the ones I mentioned, it could be something else that you care about. Um, and you want to solve this. And when I say fixed query, I'm just talking about data complexity. Um, and you want to solve this, and maybe it's an NP-complete problem, right? So the best you can really do is solve it exactly, pay exponential time, or you want to find some approximations in P time. This is something you could hope to do. The other thing you could do is you could find some structure in your query and find easy sub-instances, right? And these you want to solve exactly in p-time. And another thing you want to do is you want to find out where this border is for different problems. Now, what we propose is one unified algorithm to do all of the above, okay? Um, okay, but now before we study all of this reverse data management universe, right? Maybe it makes sense to look at the simplest possible reverse data management you can, problem you can think of. And this was proposed to be uh, this question of, OK, what minimum change would it take to just delete all of your output? right? And uh, this problem was proposed in 2015 by Sibali Fair and co-authors as resilience. And you can see this is already a very powerful problem. right? So you can diagnose points of failure. And turns out this is equivalent to deletion propagation with source side effects that's been studied for a long time. OK, so I will focus on resilience for the rest of the talk. But I want to convey that this unification algorithm that we propose is general and we hope can be applied to all of these problems. OK, so let me give you an example for resilience. Pretend you're a data analyst, right? You have access to people watching movies. And you also know that people, what items they buy. And you also know the product placement. So you know that items were featured in this movie. Now, if you have these three tables, you can ask a query like, oh, what person watches a movie and then buys an item from it, right? And this is an important question a data analyst could ask. But if you're a theoretician, all I've said here is pretend you have a triangle query, right? So let's say you have a triangle query. Uh, now you want to find 
you have some data, you want to find the resilience of this, right? So you compute your output, you get your output rows, and you have your domain values in tuples. And what you can also do is represent this as a query hypergraph, right? So now within this hypergraph, you have your hyper edges that are your witnesses, and you want to find the resilience. So what minimum tuples do I need to delete to make the output false or to delete all hyper edges, right? And this is the transversal number of the hypergra uh, hypergraph. So essentially, you just need to delete these two tuples, and your resilience value is two. Okay. Okay. Well, minimal, you mean minimal number of modifications, a set of modifications that doesn't have a subset of that's it. Uh, the minimum number. Yeah. Okay. So turns out for the triangle query, this problem is NP complete. Um, you can't do any better than that. And we've looked at the triangle query a lot, but there's also this extension. You can just add one atom here and get the triangle unary query. And it turns out for this, you can solve this in P time. And this was discovered in the 2015 paper. All right, so what are the results, right? So what is known? For self-joint free queries, um, it was shown in 2002 that if you have just project um, join queries in general, this problem's NP hard, right? But you can find subclasses of queries. So in 2015, um, th there were linear queries shown. And the intuition here, I won't get into it, but the intuition here is that you have a joint path instead of a joint tree. Um, so these are in p-time. Plus, there's another class that can be converted to linear queries. And these are in p-time as well. Um, and so the resilience for set semantics, we have a dichotomy. But what was not studied was bag semantics. So imagine you want to have different movies have multiple product placements, or you have weights or probability distributions in some way, right? You can only model this with bag semantics. And turns out we get a different dichotomy for that with the unified approach. All right, what else do we know? So how do we solve this problem? So for self-joint free queries, um, you can have different flow-based encoding. So the idea really is to take your problem, convert it to a flow graph, and find min cut. And somehow this helps you find the resilience. Um, for if you want to do exact evaluation, I guess you could always brute force, but there wasn't anything specific studied. Neither were approximations studied. Um, if you have self joins, now this is still open, but there are some restricted results in this 2020 paper by Sabali and collaborators that show that you can have some flow algorithms for specific classes of queries. Okay. Uh, what we propose is one approach that can solve the exact and the easy self-join or self-join pre-queries. And I will talk a bit about how we do this. All right. So previously set semantics, we also enlarged to bag semantics, and we can do all self-join, self-join pre-queries. Now, the interesting thing is if you have a functional dependency, you can modify your flow-based algorithm to take that into account. What our algorithm hopes to do is that if you have functional dependencies, even if they are unspecified, but they exist in the data, the algorithm automatically leverages this. So you sort of take advantage of structure in the data without explicitly defining the structure. Okay. Um, now, all of these approximations and details, I won't speak so much about in this talk. What I really like to communicate is two key ideas that make this approach unified. And um, that's the main takeaway, but I'm happy to go into more detail afterwards. So what is the unified algorithm? Essentially, it's an integer linear program. We have seen these many times before. Um, you have some constraints and some linear objective that you would like to solve. And we want to take our resilience problem and model it as an integer linear program. So let's take the same example. Our constraints are that for each hyper edge, you want to delete some tuple, right? So we have three different constraints here. Let's say for all the three witnesses, you must delete at least one of the tuples. Um, what do we minimize? We minimize the number of tuples deleted. All right, so this is clear. And for each tuple, either you delete it, it's uh, one, or you don't delete it, it's zero. So this is the integer part of the program. And if you solve this, you will get the answer too. All right, now, what if you had self-joins, right? You do the exact same thing, the same encoding, but now you don't get the same arity necessary in the constraints. You can have different variables per constraint, but it's the same procedure. And if you have bag semantics, we show that all you need to do is you need to add the number of copies to the objectives. And that's it. Those are the only sort of things you need to make it more general. All right. And now, uh, if you set the values of f1 and b2 to 1, then you do get the same resilience that we saw earlier. And all of this works. OK. 
So I, uh, now the other thing is you can take away the integrality uh, constraint and get a relaxed linear program. And um, you would get a fractional solution. This would be a natural lower bound because you're taking away some constraints. And you can obtain a lower bound for resilience. OK? All right. Now, what is the unified algorithm? You take your query, you take your database, you build an ILP like this, and you put in a solver. Now, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> ILPs are NP hard, right? So how do you recover all p time cases in p time? Like, what is going on here? OK. So now, here is the interesting part. We show a theorem that for all known p time cases, the objective of the ILP is the same as the objective of the LP, right? Um, and I will just refer to this as LP equal to ILP. Um, so, OK, we have this very nice theorem that, OK, for all these easy cases, if you just solve the relaxation, that's enough. But now I'm proposing that, oh, you just put in a solver, and that's it. You don't, how do you know whether to solve an LP or an ILP, right? So this is how a solver works, sort of Gorobi works internally, is that first they solve the linear programming relaxation, and then they sort of do a branch and bound approach based on the LP solution that they've obtained. Um, so now, if you get a solution that's exactly equal to the LP relaxation, you don't need to explore the whole space. You're sort of done, right? And you have your integral answer in p time if it's equal to the LP objective. So this is really the trick that we're using to make solvers do the hard work for us. Okay. So now, we still have one problem. How do we prove that LP equal to ILP, right? Like, this is still left. We have an algorithm, but we need a proof. And um, there's a lot of work done since many, many years on this very important question. And there are known cases like totally unimodular, balanced. There's textbooks written about this stuff. Turns out we had easy cases, p time cases, that were not totally unimodular, that were not balanced, that did not fit any of these frameworks. OK, how do we go from here? How do we prove that LP equal to ILP? So here's the interesting idea is that we use this correspondence to flow that was known earlier, right? And we build a one-to-one -one correspondence from the ILP to the flow graph that was known earlier. And we say, hey, if the ILP has a certain solution, then the flow graph has a certain cut, and they correspond exactly. So because we know this problem can be encoded as a flow graph, we just know that the LP will equal to the ILP. And we don't actually need to build this flow graph while calculating the resilience or anything. This is just a proof. We just need to convince ourselves about the existence of such a flow graph, and we're done here, right? So this is sort of the way we can use a unified approach. All right. So that was the unified algorithm. I will now talk about the unified hardness proof, right? So we've convinced ourselves that we can solve it, but when can we actually show LP equal to LP? All right. So how do you usually show hardness, right? You take some hard problem, you have some gadget, and you reduce it to the problem that you want to show is hard. OK. Uh, so if you have vertex cover, let's say you get some arbitrary graph, you want to convert it to a problem that we care about. You want to convert it to resilience. And you want to build some database that will have a resilience that is some known function f of the vertex cover. right? So you need to be able to recover the vertex cover from it. Okay. And now, generally, you define an edge gadget. So for a single edge, you map it to a database in some way. And this is your edge gadget. Now, it was conjectured in the POTS20 paper that you can use independent joint paths. And we sort of changed the definition a little bit that I can go into detail on later. But if a query forms an independent joint path, more on this, uh, then it is NP complete. And the idea is to use this independent joint path as an edge gadget. OK, so what is the independent joint path? The way we define it, it's a database with some endpoints, but it has five testable properties. Right. So the first is that, in common sense, it's connected. Second, it's, it's reduced, so every tuple participates in some witness. Um, then the third thing is that the endpoints are valid, which for the purposes of this talk, I will say just think of it as the endpoints are of the same relation. right? So you can sort of join them if need be. OK, now there's two more properties that are defined semantically. And uh, these are sort of captured the core of the vertex cover problem. So the first is the R property. And then you have to compose these edges in some way. OK, so what is the R property? So vertex cover, the way you do it, is for every edge, you want to pick A or B, right? 
So this is the key property you need in vertex cover. We want to define something analogous for resilience. Right? So what we say is, do not delete at least one side or the other. Right? Now, so in vertex cover, what you don't allow is that you don't want that you have don't pick A and don't pick B. Right? Now, if in this resilience example, you delete both uh, S1 and SP, you haven't deleted your middle hyper edge, right? And what this means is that you need a resilience of three. This is not minimal. The minimal resilience needs only two. So in vertex cover, you're violating your constraint. And here for resilience, you're violating minimality in some way. So this is the correspondence that we want to draw. The OK case is when you pick one of the two sides of vertex cover and you delete one of the two sides in your IJP. Okay? And you check all four possibilities. You check that they correspond and you get the resilience that you want. And if you have this, then we say we have the OR property. Okay. The second property that I mentioned is composability. So the vertex cover of one graph plus another gives you some graph, right? Similarly, you need to be able to take one IJP plus another and get a combined IJP, right? And this combined IJP should not have any extra witnesses being formed due to joint dependencies, right? You don't want to add two graphs and then get some extra edges. Um, so composing these two IJPs in any possible way should not lead to extra witnesses. This is another property that we want. OK. So now we have defined some notions of IJPs. And we now want to find some way of finding these IJPs, right? So our dream is to sort of take a query automatically find some independent joint path, and then show that, OK, the square is hard. How do we do this? Okay. So turns out what we also need for now is the domain size. How big do we want this hardness proof to be? More on this in a bit. But then you have your gadget. And you can just go through an exponential space of databases, right? And sort of guess an IJP. And then you verify, is this a valid IJP or not, right, for all possibilities. Now, how do you verify? You check if it has the OR property that I spoke about, and you check if it composes in some way. All right. So for the OR property, what you need to do is look at four possibilities and find the resilience in each and see if it has the OR property or not. And what this turns out to be equivalent, you find you're solving four NP problems um, that does it have a resilience of size k, and you're solving four co-NP problems. Does it not have a resilience of size k minus one? Okay. And the way we think we need more expressivity is because you're solving four NP and co NP problems as a subroutine. So you need something of the second polynomial order to be able to do this automatically in some way. All right. Now, for composing, there are many possible ways you could compose, right? So, do we need to check all exponential ways in which IJPs could compose? Turns out, no. Turns out, all you need to do is check the interaction between three IJPs in this specific way, where you have like all possible variations of the input arrows. And if, these, if this graph composes, then that's sort of all you need. And you will always have composability. So this is something you can easily check. Then. Okay. So because we need to be, because we think we need something in the second polynomial order, we use this idea, uh, we use disjunctive logic program that actually has this expressivity. And we use this a very neat trick called saturation that was discovered in the 90s. And it's sort of like um, what Max spoke about equality saturation, except you saturate your model with all possible answers. And you use the minimal model semantics of answer set programming to be able to solve NP and co NP problems as a subroutine. So it's a very neat sort of idea that we use in building our program. Hi. Now, with this program that we built, we were actually able to prove hardness for queries that were open. So all of these figures are sort of queries whose hardness was not known. And there were seven open listed cases in the 2020 paper. And we were able to show that five of them are actually hard. And if you look at all of these, uh, then you can sort of check that you can compose them in any way, and they have the OR property. And essentially, you can just plug it into our proof with vertex cover, and you can show that you get an end-to-end -end proof saying that this query is hard. Okay. Can you just 
to check I understand correctly this like coin P uh, like higher level of the polynomial hierarchy kind of complexity is not the complexity of the problem itself but of like the meta problem of figuring out the given queries. Yes. Yes. And uh yes, so this is the complexity of the meta problem, you're right. And I also want to mention that this is uh, not a lower bound or anything. This is just the way we can do it right now. It's possible you can do it faster, but this is the way we know how to do it. And it works sort of in practice to help us find hardness for open questions. Okay. And now the interesting thing is for all previously known hard queries, you can recover hardness, plus you can find these interesting new cases. Okay. So now we have some terms and conjectures. So we know that if you have this independent joint path, that's sort of enough to prove hardness. You can build an end to end proof. We also know that for self joint free queries, this is the only thing you need. So if you don't have an IJP, then it's not hard. This is sort of the only hardness properties you need. Now, what we conjecture is that for all queries, including self joints, IJPs are sort of all you need, right? So we really think that this is a universal hardness criterion that you can automate. And what we also think is that if you have an IJP, so this is when I'm talking about the domain size, we think that you only need to look up to a restricted domain size, and this is enough. So you don't need to check the space of all exponential many IJPs, but you just need to go up to a certain size. And if you have a hardness proof by then, that's it. Otherwise, you don't need to check everything. So what this means is you can actually automate it. So if, if both of these conjectures were true, then all you would need to do is really run our DLP. And if it returns something, it's hard. Otherwise, it's not. So this is something that we believe and I propose. All right. Now, the other thing that we believe is that if there's no IJP, then you can solve it with an LP, right? So for all known easy cases, it's true that LP equal to ILP. But we believe that for all easy cases, LP equal to ILP. And this is something we think will help as a universal algorithm. All right. We also think that if there is no IJP, then there exists some flow encoding, and we can use that flow encoding as a proof. So this is this big table of conjectures. All right. So what are the takeaways here? So we have a unified algorithm, and the cool thing is that's all you need, but now you need to show that it actually uh, is speed time, right? So if you have an easy case, you already know how to solve it. You just need to prove that it's easy. So it's this change in perspective, right? And the other unification is that of the hardness criterion. And because of it, we are allowed automatic search. And that should help make finding hardness cases easier. Now, the other thing is, how can we extend this? So I only spoke about resilience. If we also apply this approach to causal responsibility and get sort of the same thing, that for all known p-time cases, LP, uh, the so that we get the mixed integer linear program equal to ILP, but it's the same idea, and we're able to use IJPs as well. Similarly, for minimal factorization, we can also sort of use these same unified ideas. And there is, um, I claim that many more problems that we care about in database theory can be tackled with a very similar unified approach. Okay. And a lot more details, experiments, approximations are all available online. Thank you. What? So this is very interesting, right? But uh, like one one idea is like we propose this to extend it to more of problems, right? Another one might be to increase the class of queries. Do you see any hope there to go beyond uh, the class of queries you currently support? Uh, so do you have an example for what sort of queries? Maybe things where we to do some limited type of aggregation, for example, or the negations for the auto window, I don't know. But I think negation is not out of the window, actually. Uh, I think the, so the approach uh, can be extended to uh, the queries. And my intuition for this is, so for these examples that I spoke about, causal responsibility and minimal factorization. Yes, yeah, so, so already in the ILP, they have negation. So the constraints, you need to introduce negatives, which is not the case in resilience problems. And the approaches still work. So the LP equal to ILP stuff still works. And for the IJPs as well, like maybe the OR property will have to be defined differently, but I think this overall idea would still work. Um, so, so I think a unified approach that this is very appealing. I wonder, with respect to the extension to other problems, while the encoding may work, it may not be 
the most efficient or, or practical thing to do. And, you know, for example, say if you see data generation as a reverse data management problem, mm -hmm. you need to find the constraints that you want your data to satisfy and try to enforce it. Like your, your constraints can grow in the size of right. the data, right? So, so then maybe the encoding just becomes too large. Right. So yes, it's it's possible that for all for all problems, this might not be the most efficient encoding. I would say two things here. So the first is that if indeed your problem is in a lower fine grain p time complexity class and ILPs are well p complete, maybe you can indeed do better. But in most cases, um, what what we're sort of using here is that ILP solvers are there's been a lot of work done on them. And sort of if you don't care about developing heuristics for your problem or you don't care about, you know, putting in a lot of your own expertise, domain knowledge, you can already use existing knowledge in ILP solvers and just sort of black box take advantage of it. Um, so that sort of is the other advantage. Yeah, yeah, I find it's very interesting. My question is also about extending the language of queries. And like, the one class I would have in mind would be like recursive queries, like RPQs, data log, and so on. And seeing a bit about the techniques that you use, at least to show hardness, I get the impression that if you have this gadget having these properties that you have hardness of the query, and then you really need to care that the query is a UCQ. Or can you just rely on some semantic properties of the query to be able to use these gadgets? So. Of course, what I have in mind is homomorphism close queries because I've done something. I have a work like this where we have uh, we just use the fact that the query is homomorphism close. We don't care in which language it is posed, and so I'm wondering if the same the same approach could be used here to get essentially for free a hardness results for uh, more general queries. So I haven't thought about recursive queries um, very deeply, but I so my intuition is that it works uh, simply because the last two properties are defined semantically, right? So we say that, oh, if it has an R property and if it composes, then it's sort of an IJP. But maybe the, the terms that we use for showing composability are different in different query settings. Maybe the way you show the R property is different in different query settings. But because this portion is sort of defined semantically, and we're just so, sort of saying that, hey, these are the properties that we want for our reduction to work, that's why I think it might be able to generalize. Yeah. It's still very much future work. Okay, great. And let's take half an hour break and we're going to ring the bell. Thank you.